Content warning. The Matherson marriage contains unhealthy relationship dynamics and fictional domestic abuse. If you are in a real-life Matherson marriage, please reach out to the appropriate authorities for help. Resources you may find helpful include the Pixel Project's Domestic Violence Resource page and UN Women's International Helplines list. Resources will be linked in the video description for accessibility. Hi, I'm Morgan, and today I will be reading from The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Chapter 2 Pansy left the dinner table as soon as she could, and Joyce followed. She slipped an arm round Pansy's waist, and they went out into the garden. I don't want to be inquisitive, Joyce said presently, but you might have told me, amongst other things, that Mr. Ramsden was good-looking. Pansy looked up in bewilderment. What do you mean? She protested. I never spoke to you about him. I never knew he was coming here. I don't know what you mean. Joyce laughed. <laughs> Little storyteller! Why, we were talking about him at lunch. Isn't he the boy you said was so much in love with you before you met Basil? Pansy gasped and flushed. Why, however did you know? She asked. Joyce made a little grimace. Well, he said you had known one another years ago, she answered. And I guessed the rest. Pansy looked angry. Nonsense! How would you have known? I did, by the way he looked at you, and by the way you avoided looking at him. Pansy pushed her friend's arm away. What absolute rubbish, she said angrily. You do imagine things. If Mr. Ramsden liked me once, it's years ago, and he's forgotten all about it. Oh, well, if he's forgotten, that's all right, Joyce said dryly. The men joined them at that moment, and Basil drew Pansy aside. I want to speak to you about Ramsden, he said. Pansy looked up, her, fa her color fading. About Mr. Ramsden? Yes, it's a bit of luck you're having known him before, her husband went on complacently, because it will make things easier. I want you to be nice to him, Pansy. Nice to him? She repeated his words incredulously. What do you mean, Basil? Just what I say. His fingers tightened on her arm. He can be a very useful man to me, he explained. Useful? To you? How do, how you do repeat my words, he objected testily. I said useful, and I mean it. He's a rich man. I suppose you know that. Rich? <laughs> Pansy laughed. He was poor enough years ago when he used to come to the vicarage, she, she said. And she remembered how she had taunted him with his poverty and made it an excuse for her unkindness. Well, he's not poor now, Basil said, and he can be useful to me. You remember that, and make yourself agreeable to him. He released her and moved away. Pansy followed quickly, but Basil, he turned. There's no need to argue. I've said all that need to be, I've said all that need to be said. Pansy fell back, bewildered and apprehensive. Why was Basil so difficult lately, she wondered. She looked after him with wistful eyes. He had joined Ramsden and Joyce, and the two men were talking and laughing together, apparently on the best of terms. Pansy felt herself lonely and unwanted. Both these men had once been, had once been her ardent lovers. Each had sworn that they could not be happy without her, and now, apparently, they preferred each other's company to hers. It seemed as if Lynn Ramsden could feel her thoughts, for he turned suddenly and looked back. All alone, Mrs. Matherson. He stopped, waiting for her, and Basil and Joyce turned back to the house. I was just telling your husband how I envy his lovely garden. It's much finer than Criswell's. Criswell's? Pansy looked up swiftly. What do you know about Criswell's? She asked, and her heart began to beat quickly. He met her gaze serenely. I've just bought it, didn't you know? You'll have me for quite a near neighbor in the future. Pansy caught her breath, and it was an effort for her to answer. Uh, Criswell's is very nice. I think I like it better than this. It's, it's not so big. The garden is not so fine. No, there was a little silence. Then Pansy said breathlessly, And will you be coming to live there? Always. Have you any objection? He asked. Pansy shook her head. No, no, of course not. How could I have? It only seems queer that after all these years we should have you, you for our nearest neighbor. He did not answer, and she hastened to add, remembering her husband's injunction. Of course, it will be very nice. Ramsden laughed. <laughs> thanks, thanks very much, he said, but I don't suppose I shall pester you with my attentions as I did six years ago, he added dryly. Pansy flushed. 
You told Basil at dinner that you only came to tea with us once or twice, she reminded him offendedly. He laughed. <laughs> I did that for your sake, she looked up. For my sake? Yes, and partly for my own, I admit, he answered. You see, I couldn't very well give him lurid accounts of the way I used to haunt the, mo the house morning, noon, and night, just to get a glimpse of you, could I? He used to do the same thing himself, Pansy retorted, not quite truthfully. I'm not surprised at that, Ramsden answered, only he evidently did it with better success than I. What do you mean? Why, that you married him. And then his voice changed suddenly, and he looked down at her in a way that reminded her vividly of that evening six years ago, when he had, ki when he had asked her to kiss him goodbye. But all he said now was, Pansy, I'm glad, that, I'm glad that you are so comfortably settled. She noticed that he did not say happily, and she dared not look at him for fear her eyes would betray her. In the past, he had understood her so well, read her thoughts so easily, that she feared he might see the truth in her eyes and know that his prophecy had come true, and that she was neither happy nor satisfied. To change the subject, she said, You must see Buster. I want you to see my son. With childish eagerness, she caught his hand. Come and see him now. He's in bed, but I don't suppose he'll be asleep. Do come and see him, will you? Of course I will. He let himself be led back to the house and across the hall. Don't talk too loudly, she whispered as they passed the smoking room. Basil may be in there, and if he hears us going upstairs, he'll try and prevent it. She laughed nervously. <laughs> he says I spoil Buster. Perhaps I do, but he's such a darling. She was still holding his hand, but now she let it go, and ran on ahead of him up the stairs. Lynn Ramsden followed, feeling rather as if he were in a dream, and as if none of these things could really be happening. He waited for a moment on the landing, while Pansy softly turned the handle of the nursery door and looked in. Then she, smiled, then she smilingly beckoned to him. He's fast asleep, bless him, she whispered, but you can just have a peep. Ramsden followed silently, and they stood together looking down at the sleeping boy. Buster was a picture of youth and innocence as he lay there, one chubby arm flung up on the pillow above his head, and his face flushed with healthy sleep. Pansy bent and kissed his hair. Isn't he a darling? she whispered. Lynn had been looking at Buster with a queer expression in his eyes, and he turned away as he answered. He is very much like you. Pansy drew the quilt closer around her little son. I'm so glad you think so. She followed him downstairs and to the open front door. It was getting dark in the garden now, and the air was fragrant with the scent of roses. Pansy sat down on the stone co on the stone coping that bordered the steps. Are you engaged or anything? she asked suddenly. Ramsden was lighting a cigarette, and he blew the match out leisurely before he answered. No, not engaged, or anything. Pansy looked up, and it was too dark to see his face. What a pity, she said, and she tried hard to make her voice unconcerned. Why aren't you? You must have met lots of nice girls. There was a little silence. Then Ramsden asked in a hard voice, Are you really interested, or are you, are you trying to play the devil with me again as you did six years ago? Pansy gave a stifled cry. <gasps> what do you mean? How dare you speak to me like that? Of course I'm interested. I thought we were friends. There's nothing strange in asking why you're not... Engaged, surely. She spoke incoherently. She was frightened because she knew how correctly he had guessed that she had been tempted to try her power over him once again. Then she rose to her feet, looking up at him with angry eyes. He was looking at her, too, and though she could not see his face, it seemed as if the years were wiped out and forgotten, and they were just a boy and girl together as they had been that May evening six years ago. Some day you shall give me that kiss again. His words came to her out of the past as if they had been spoken yesterday, and impulsively she put out her hand. Lynn, his name broke from her against her will. She was in the sway of some new, bewildering emotion. She even moved a step towards him, when the smoking room door in the hall behind them opened and Basil came out. She heard him she heard him call to her. Pansy, are you there, Pansy? But she could not have answered had her life depended on it. She turned, panic-stricken, and fled away into the dusky garden. Basil Matherson joined Lynn at the front door. He peered past him into the darkness. Isn't Pansy here? I thought I saw her. Isn't my wife here? Ramsden was lighting another cigarette. She was a few moments ago. She was into the garden, he said between puffs. He looked round. Shall I see if I can find her for you? Matherson shrugged her shoulders. No, it, it doesn't matter. It will do later on. 
He paused. Women are the very devil, he broke out irritably. My wife has never grown up. She's still the girl she was when I married her, and it's not right. A married woman with a child, and she's bringing the boy up in the way she was brought up herself to run wild. She's no regard for appearances, never had. He looked at his companion. He looked at his companion through the dusk. But, of course, you know if you stayed at Lidstow. Mrs. Matherson was very young when I knew her, Ramsden said quietly. Only about seventeen, I should think. She's only about seventeen now, the way she goes on, Matherson grumbled. For a little while, both men smoked in silence. Then Ramsden threw his cigarette end into the garden and looked at his watch. Well, it's time I was off. It's nearly half past ten. The train, the last train goes at ten fifty-three. Basil spoke hurriedly. Don't hurry. There's no hurry. When will you be down again? I want to see you about that business I mentioned. If you could run down, say, the day after tomorrow, or shall I meet you in town? I can, if you prefer it. Won't it do next week? I shall be at Chiswell's for good ne for good next I shall be at Chiswell's for good next week, you know. He turned back into the hall as he spoke, and Matherson followed, frowning. I don't like putting things off, he complained. The sooner the better. Very well. Ramsden took his coat from the rack. I'll run down the day after tomorrow. Mather Matherson's face cleared. Thanks. Thanks very much. That will do. I've ordered the car for you and Pansy. Where the devil is Pansy? There's no need to disturb, Mrs. Matherson, Lynn said hurriedly. I shall be seeing her again soon. Say good night for me, will you? Nonsense. She must be somewhere about. He stopped a servant who was crossing the hall. Find your mistress, will you? Tell her Mr. Ramsden is going. Ramsden stood waiting. The car had driven up to the front door, its glaring headlights splitting the darkness. The minutes passed. Matherson fidgeted. He went to the foot of the stairs and called, Pansy! Pansy! The chauffeur came to the door. We have to be going to catch the 1053, sir. Ramsden moved to the door. Please say goodnight to Mrs. Matherson for me. I don't want to lose the train, or it means you'll have to give me a bed, Matherson. Delighted only due to lie to change your, change your mind and stay! Thanks, but they are expecting me back. The two men shook hands. The day after tomorrow, then, Matherson said. The car started away, and Matherson turned back into the hall, closing the front door behind him. He was just latching it when Pansy knocked sharply on the glass panel from outside. Basil, let me in, let me in. He opened the door impatiently. Where have you been? Ramsden's gone, and I couldn't find you anywhere to say goodnight. A oh, nice, disgraceful thing. I thought I told you to make yourself agreeable to him. I, I was only in the garden. I should have come if you had called me. I did call you. I suppose you stayed out purposefully. Pansy walked past him to the stairs, but he followed. Did you hear what I said? He demanded. What do you mean by behaving in this fashion? When I say I want a thing done, I mean it. Do you understand? Yes. Well then, next time Ramsden comes, you be civil to him. Do you hear? Or it will be the worse for you. Pansy looked back over her shoulder, her gray eyes dark with anger. Perhaps it will be the worst for you, she answered with a strange little laugh. <laughs> then she ran up the stairs and disappeared. And that is the end of chapter two of The Matherson Marriage by Ruby M. Ayers. Thank you for listening to this chapter with me, and I hope you return soon for the next one. Have a great day.